I am still in the mood to think about airships. And so I dug a little deeper and found a few different interesting things that I wanted to share. I want to share a chapter from a book called The Airships at War, which goes back to a decent amount of history about airships in general and some theory about ancient airships, which is really cool. And then I also want to show a video of a 1929 airship coming across the world and landing in New York. And you can see the people there that are there, that just everything about it. And then I've got a bunch of different collections. One collection of polar exploration of using an airship that kind of failed miserably. And then a bunch of other photos of amazing airships in the past that I think you all will enjoy. And it just puts more theories out there about what these things are, how old are they really, who were the first inventors of them? How far were people going in them? These seem like if you could cross the world with like two or three fill-ups, um, you could go pretty far. And again, just more signs that this little area that they tell us is all there is, is definitely most likely not. These things probably could have gone all over the place. There could be airships, ancient ones flying up there. The stars could be airships for all we know. I am willing to just ponder anything. And because these are just, they just seem too ancient. They seem like what we were, it seems like people were almost trying to catch back up or there was some technology they lost and they couldn't figure it out or, uh, you know, something didn't translate, but this generation, this civilization just couldn't do what they did in the past. But again, all the texts are altered. Everything's only what we need to see or what we're allowed to see. And it all fits a particular narrative that they craft. So. I don't know what to believe again, but I found this reading interesting and it brings up a lot of theories. So let me know what you think in the comments and enjoy. It is from this book here and I'm going to read chapter 5 and there's some cool stuff. So here we go. The Balloon in Warfare. But there is another practical use for the balloon to which we must now refer and that a most important one. It's employment in wartime. It was not long after the invention of this ship of the skies that soldiers began to realize what a valuable aid it might be to them in times of battle, enabling them to see inside a camp, fort, or beleaguered city, or watch the enemy's movements from afar off. The opportunity for first putting the matter to the test very soon arose. Within a very few years of the earliest balloon experiments in France, there commenced in that very country the dreadful French Revolution, and soon the nation found itself at war with all the world and forced to hold its own alone against the armies of Europe, whatever happened there, who knows. This danger quickened the minds of all to the importance of making use of every possible means of defense in their power. It was suggested that the newly discovered balloon might be turned to account, and immediately a school for military ballooning was established near Paris. Fifty young military students were trained in the new art, and suitable balloons were provided. The value of their work was soon apparent. In June 1794 was fought the Battle of Fleurus between the French and Austrians. Before the fight, a balloon party had carefully observed the position of the Austrian forces, and through the information they gave, the French were able to gain a speedy and decisive victory. In this way, and at this early stage, the value of the war balloon was at once established. Curiously enough, Napoleon would make no use of balloons in his campaigns, and even did away with the balloon school at Paris. The reason given for his prejudice is a curious one. At the time of his coronation, a large unmanned balloon, gaily decorated and carrying thousands of lights, was sent up from Paris during the evening's illuminations. It was a very beautiful object, and behaved splendidly, sailing away into the night, amidst great popular rejoicing, until it was lost to sight in the darkness. But at daybreak next morning it was seen approaching the city of Rome, where it presently arrived, actually hovering, hovering over St. Peter's in the Vatican. Then, as if its mission were fulfilled, it settled to earth and finally fell in Lake Bracciano. But as it fell, it rent itself, and left a portion of the crown with which it was ornamented on the tomb of the Roman Emperor Nero. Napoleon, who was always a superstitious man, saw in this extraordinary voyage some dreadful forecast of his own fate. He was much disturbed and forbade the matter ever to be mentioned in his presence, nor would he henceforward have any more to do with balloons. <laughs> That sounds like a nice story to me, a nice fairy tale. Military balloons, balloons were used by the French again, however, during their war in Africa in 1830. The Austrians also used them in 1849, and it is said the Russians had them at the Siege of Sebastopol in the Crimean War. 
Some things never change. A Montgolfier balloon was made use by the French in 1862 at the Battle of Solferino, and the Americans also employed balloons during the Civil War a year later, something I've never really heard before. The American war balloons were comparatively small ones, inflated with hydrogen. The hydrogen was manufactured in the way already described by pouring dilute sulfuric acid upon scrap iron. For making the gas, and now this page is blurred out. I'm not sure if it's intentional or not, but I'll try to read it. It says, uh, let's see, for making the gas upon the field of large with large banks of wood called generators were used. In the something, the water and scrap iron were placed, and the something po placed uh, poured upon them, the acid poured upon them. The gas produced being uh, something to, carried to the balloon through pipes, uh, pursing f per proving first through vessels filled with something water in cool and partly it. I apologize, this is so blurry. When on the march, four wrapped were sufficient to carry the whole apparatus. The inflation which took... Uh, something was made so close to the something the car um, company safe and when the balloon was it fell a party of men I have no idea it's just so blurry they I think they deliberately shrunk some pages in this book but here we go the next one is not shrunk so here we go it could easily tow it about to where it was needed but the time when the balloon was most largely and most usefully used in time of war was during the siege of Paris in the month of September 1870, during the Franco-Prussian War, Paris was closely invested by the Prussian forces and for 18 long weeks lay besieged and cut off from all the rest of the world. No communication with the city was possible, either by road, river, rail, or telegraph, nor could the inhabitants convey tidings of their plight, save by one means alone. Only the passage of the air was open to them. I wonder how they stopped the telegraph. I guess the wires, but who knows. All right. Quite at the beginning of the siege, it occurred to the Parisians that they might use balloons to escape from the beleaguered town and pass over the heads of the enemy to safety beyond. An inquiry was at once made to discover what aeronautical resources were at their command. It was soon found that with only one or two exceptions, the balloon actually in existence, balloons actually in existence within the walls were unserviceable or unsuitable for the work on hand, being mostly old ones which had been laid aside as worthless. One lucky discovery was, however, made. Two professional aeronauts of well-proved experience and skill were in Paris at the time. These were M. M. Goddard and Jan, both of whom had been in London only a short time before in connection with a huge captive balloon which was then being exhibited there. They had once received orders to establish two balloon factories and begin making a large number of balloons as quickly as possible. For their workshops, they were given the use of two great railway stations, then standing idle and deserted. No better places for the purpose could be imagined, for under the great glass roofs there was plenty of space and the work went on apace. As the balloons were intended to make only one journey each, plain white or colored calico, of which there was plenty in the city, covered with quick drying varnish, was considered good enough for their material. Hundreds of men and women were employed at the two factories, and altogether some sixty balloons were turned out during the siege. Their management was entrusted to sailors, who of all men seemed most fitted for the work. The only previous training that could be given them was to sling them up to the roof of the railway stations in a balloon car, and there make them go through the actions of throwing out ballast, dropping the anchor, and pulling the valve line. This was, of course, very like learning to swim on dry land. Nevertheless, these amateurs made, on the whole, very fair aeronauts. But before the first of the new balloons was ready experiments, were already being made with a few old balloons then in Paris. Two were moored captive at different ends of the town to act as observation stations from whence the enemy's movements could be watched. Captive ascents were made in them every few hours. Meanwhile, M. Duruoff, a professional aeronaut, made his escape from the city in an old and unskyworthy balloon called Le Neptune, descending safely outside the enemy's lines, while another equally successful voyage was made with two small balloons fastened together. And then, as soon as the possibility of leaving Paris by this means was fully proved, an important new development arose. So far as was shown, tidings of the besieged city could be conveyed to the outside world. But how was news from without to reach those imprisoned within? The problem was presently solved in a most ingenious way. There was in Paris, when the siege commenced, 
a society or club of pigeon fanciers who are especially interested in the breeding and training of carrier or homing pigeons. The leaders of this club now came forward and suggested to the authorities that with the aid of the balloons, their birds might be turned to practical account as letter carriers. The idea was at once taken up, and henceforward every balloon that sailed out of Paris contained not only letters and dispatches, but also a number of properly trained pigeons, which, when liberated, would find their way back to their homes within the walls of the besieged city. When the pigeons had been safely brought out of Paris and fallen into friendly hands beyond the Prussian forces, they were attached to the tail feathers of each of them goose quills about two inches long, fastened on by silken thread or thin wire. Inside these were tiny scraps of photographic film, not much larger than postage stamps, upon which a large number of messages had been photographed by microscopic photography. So skillfully was this done that each scrap of film could contain 2,500 messages of 20 words each. A bird might easily carry a dozen of these films, for the weight was always less than one gram, or fifteen and a half grains. One bird, in fact, arrived in Paris on the 3rd of February carrying 18 films containing altogether 40,000 messages. To avoid accidents, several copies of the same film were made and attached to different birds. When any of the pigeons arrived in Paris, their dispatches were enlarged and thrown on a screen by a magic lantern, and then copied and sent to those for whom they were intended. This system of balloon and pigeon post went on during the whole siege. Between 60 and 70 balloons left the city, carrying altogether nearly 200 people and two and a half million letters, weighing in all about 10 tons. The greater number of these arrived in safety, while the return journeys accomplished by the birds were scarcely less successful. The weather was very unfavorable during most of the time, and cold and fogs prevented many pigeons from making their way back to Paris. Of 360 birds brought safely out of the city by balloon, only about 60 returned, but these had carried between them some 100,000 messages. Of the balloons themselves, two, each with its luckless aeronaut, were blown out to sea and never heard of more. Two sailed into Germany and were captured by the enemy. Three more came too soon and fell into the hands of the besieging army near Paris, and one did not even get as far as the Prussian lines. Others experienced accidents and rough landings in which their passengers were more or less injured. Moreover, each balloon which sailed by day from the city became at once a mark for the enemy's fire, so much so that before long it became necessary to make all the ascents by night under cover of darkness. They were brave men indeed who dared face the perils of a night voyage in an untried balloon manned by an unskilled pilot and exposed to the fire of the enemy into whose hands they ran the greatest risk of falling. It is small wonder there was much excitement in Paris when it became known that the first of the new balloons was made during the siege was to take away no less a personage than M. Gambetta, the great statesman, who was at that time, and for long after, the leading man in France, whatever that means. He made his escape by balloon on the 7th of October, accompanied by his secretary and an aeronaut, and managed to reach a safe haven, though not before they had been vigorously fired at by shot and shell, and M. Gambetta himself had actually been grazed on the hand by a bullet. Another distinguished man who hazarded the same perilous feat, though for a very different reason, was M. Jansen, a famous astronomer. On the 22nd of December of that year, there was to take place an important total eclipse of the sun which would be visible in Spain and Algeria. It had long been M. Jansen's intention to observe this eclipse, and for this purpose he had prepared a special telescope and apparatus, but when the time drew near, he found himself and his instruments shut up in besieged Paris with no possible means of escape except the dangerous and desperate hazard of a voyage by sky. But so great was the astronomer's enthusiasm for his work that he resolved to brave even this risk, taking the essential parts of his telescope with him and as aeronaut, an active young sailor, he set sail in the darkness of a winter's morning, long before dawn, passed safely over the enemy's lines, and continued the voyage till nearly midday when they sighted the sea and came down near the mouth of the river Loire, having traveled 300 miles in little more than five hours. Neither Jansen or his telescope were injured in the descent, though the wind was high at the time, and both reached Algeria in time for the eclipse. It must have been a most bitter disappointment to the ardent astronomer, after all his exertions, that when the great day arrived, the sun was hidden by clouds, and he was unable to observe the sight for which he had risked so much. I hate when that happens. It always seems cloudy on eclipses. Since the Franco-Prussian War, military ballooning has been largely developed, and now all great armies possess their properly equipped and trained balloon corps. 
The balloons in use in the British Army at the present day are made not of silk, but of gold beater's skin, a very thin but extremely tough membrane prepared from the insides of oxen. This is of course much stronger and more durable than ordinary balloon fabric, but much more expensive. The balloons are comparatively small ones of 10,000 feet capacity and are inflated with hydrogen. The hydrogen is now no longer made upon the field, but is manufactured in special factories and carried compressed in large steel cylinders. By this means, the time occupied in filling the balloon is much reduced, but the weight of the cylinders is very great. As will be remembered, balloons were made of considerable use during the late Boer War. At the siege of Ladysmith, they were thought of much value in directing the fire of the British artillery, and again at Spion Cope and Magersfontein are said to have done good service. We'll have to check those out. So far we have shown of what use balloons may be in times of peace and war. Every year sees fresh development, improvements and developments in balloons for military purposes and in those employed for making meteorological and other similar observations, and there is no doubt that great advances may shortly be expected in both these directions. But there is yet another and totally different science to which the balloon may lend its aid and help greatly to add our knowledge, and this is the science of geography, or the study of the Earth's surface. One of the earliest ideas suggested by Montgolfier's invention was that the balloon might be turned to practical account in the exploring in un of unknown and inaccessible tracts of the world. It was suggested that in a balloon men might sail over and survey country that they were not able to reach in any other way. Deserts could be crossed in this fashion, forests and mountain ranges, and even the desolate ice tracts of the North and South Poles and whatever's beyond. All this is, in truth, perfectly possible, and another day may be accomplished. But at present, great difficulties and dangers stand in the way of exploring by balloon, and up to the present time, with one great exception, no special attempt has been made. It has already been mentioned that both Wise and Green wish to cross the Atlantic by sky, and indeed, at the present moment, plans are actually being made on the continent for a similar voyage. This, however, can scarcely be called exploring. Other suggestions which may presently be put to the test are the crossing of the Sahara and also of another great desert in Central Arabia into which no white man has ever succeeded in penetrating. Recent expeditions both to the North and South Poles have also taken with them balloons to be used captive for the observation of the state of the ice ahead and for obtaining wide views around. The one great attempt at exploring by balloon which has so far been made has, unfortunately, met with hopeless and terrible disaster. This was the ill-fated voyage to the North Pole of Andre and his companions. The idea of reaching the pole by balloon was first proposed many years ago and both French and English aeronauts at different times have made suggestions as to the best way in which it might be accomplished. Nothing, however, was attempted until about the year 1894 when M. S. A. Andre, a well-known Swedish balloonist who had already met with exciting experiences in the air, made up his mind actually to risk the venture. His plan was to take a suitable balloon and the apparatus for inflating it to a place as far north as a ship could safely go, then to fill the balloon and wait for a favorable wind which should carry him right over the pole and beyond until inhabited country was reached. By the summer of 1896, all his preparations were complete. His balloon was an enormous one, capable of holding 162,000 cubic feet of gas, and was fitted with a rudder sail and a long trail rope, by means of which Andre hoped to be able to some extent to steer his course across the ice. Two companions were to accompany him on his voyage, and on June 7th, the party embarked with all their apparatus and were conveyed to Spitsbergen. They landed at Danes Island, where their first work was to build themselves a shed. They then got their gas-making apparatus into order and filled the balloon, and by the 27th of July were all ready for a start. But the wind was contrary, and day after day they waited in vain for a change, until at last the captain of the ship, which had brought them, warned them that they would be frozen in for the winter unless they returned without delay. Very reluctantly, therefore, they abandoned their venture for that year and went home, leaving behind them the shed and gas generator for another occasion. The winter passed, and by the end of next May, they were back again at Danes Island. Their shed and apparatus had suffered damage during their absence and had to be repaired, and their preparations were not complete until the end of June. But again, the wind was contrary, and for three weeks more, they waited impatiently. 
All this while, the balloon remained inflated, and by the long delay must have lost a considerable amount of its buoyancy. At last the wind changed, and though it was not exactly in the direction they wished, being a little west of south instead of due south, Andre felt he could wait no longer, and at half past two in the afternoon of July 11th set sail with his two friends on his daring voyage. What followed is soon told. Eleven days later, one of the carrier pigeons taken by Andre in his balloon was picked up by a fishing boat off Spitzbergen. Fastened to it was the following message. July 13, 1230, 82 degrees 2 minutes north, latitude 15 degrees 5 east longitude. Good journey eastward. All goes well on board. Andre. This was the latest news ever heard of the ill-fated voyagers. Later, on two of Andre's buoys, thrown out from the balloon, were found, but the messages these contained were dated on the evening of July 11th, only a few hours after the start. If the date of the first message can be relied on, it would seem that after 48 hours, Andre's balloon was still sailing well, and he had already accomplished the longest voyage aloft ever made. Of his subsequent fate and that of his companions, nothing is known. Search expeditions have failed to find any trace of them or of the balloon, and many rumors received have been proved to be false. There can be no possible reason to doubt that these brave men perished in their daring attempt and that their bones lie in the Arctic Sea or in the waste of ice and snow that surrounds the pole. Or, and this is me adding it, maybe they reached something inhabited and they were found and maybe they found the way out. Maybe they discovered it. Maybe they were greeted with a hero's welcome for those few people who just take the bold plunge and go as far north as humanly possible by whatever means necessary to win the prize of ultimate freedom. Our freedom here is not what we think it is. We are in mental slavery. We are in just a constant system that just keeps us down. I wonder if there is an escape and if beyond there it's a lot different, a lot better, something not even recognizable to us in their lifestyle. Most likely because whatever we see and whatever we're smothered in is a lot different. But look at these buildings too, New York. Jeez, what a mystery. How old was that? Purchased by an Indian for like a stick of gum and a plant of tobacco or whatever the stupid story goes. So many of these stories are absolute garbage. So many things we've been taught are just total lies, almost riddles that somehow hide the truth in plain sight but are like just the people that know are just laughing at how dumb and how far gone we've all descended with the education system that's polluted our minds and just made us go down all these wrong avenues. When every magnet points north, all of us mentally, it's just a sign. Something is north that we need to see. We need to know what it is. This is my old artwork called Sailboat to Maru, where I imagine just taking a sailboat, an airship-ish sailboaty water thing, vessel, going straight to Maru, going right to north, pointing that needle to north and just going. Nothing stopping. And these airships, whether they were powered by the gases or by some form of ethereal device, which I think was more of a past kind of uh, discovery, who knows? But if so, it would be no problem to go beyond the poles. And maybe that's why they got rid of the technology. Maybe they knew that it was easy to go over the poles and to travel beyond the realm with the balloon, so they had to get it up. They couldn't let that technology last with this new population of people because they might want to try it. More people might want to try it, and they can't have that. They can't have that precious discovery be known to anyone. So there's no telling what happened to these explorers, but I thought you all would like this glimpse into the past and all these different uses for the war, like going over and spying on them, sending the pigeons, all amazing stuff. The past is a wonderful <laughs> mystery, and I hope we keep unraveling it together. Love to hear your comments below. Share, do whatever you want. Bless you all.